Okay, good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you all here tonight's IES committee meeting. Uh, I'd like to start with the uh, statement of acknowledgement. Uh, we would like to acknowledge this land that we meet on today is the traditional land of the Ghana people and that we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge the Ghana people as the custodians of the Greater Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important for living Ghana people today. Uh, roll call. We've We've got most people here, although we've got some some apologies from Nathan and Kelvin, and Jim's not here yet, so we will, what do we do for Jim? Just say he's not here yet. Okay, that's fine. Okay, uh, so we've got the two apologies. Yep. Uh, any motions to grant leave of absence? Anybody? Leave of absence, no leave of absence, and non-attendance, I suppose. We'll wait to see what Jim does. Okay, uh, public open forum. We've got one person that wants to speak in the public open forum tonight, and that's Mr. Jack Gill, and he's a community member. And he's gonna talk about the Climate Emergency Action, action Plan, the draft action plan. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Kosh and elected members. For those that aren't aware, my name is Jack Gill, and I am Deputy Chair of the Youth Advisory Committee, Chair of the Global Environment Centre, and Youth Rep on the Climate Emergency Action Plan Working Group. And in 2020, Council voted to send me to Melbourne for the National Climate Emergency Summit, which I reported back on uh, at the end of, in about March, April last year, which feels like a long time ago. I'm very proud of the Climate Emergency Action Plan document. It has been a lot of hard work by both Council staff elected members and community representatives, and some of them are here with us tonight, which is really good. The document is a re realistic snapshot of council and community greenhouse gas emissions, along with practical, achievable, and realistic opportunities for council to take drastic action to reduce their emissions, whilst also reaping the co-benefits of financials, noise, health, etc. Additionally, the various goals set in the document have already been achieved around the world, from EV fleet transition to 100% renewable energy, either on-site generation or purchased from a reputable retailer. It isn't based on potential developments technologically that, in, that are planned in the future that may never eventuate. It should be iterated that the SEAP document does not suggest finding, funding household upgrades or businesses to take part in the transition, but instead it empowers homeowners, community members and businesses through information sharing, advocacy and engaging partnerships through organizations such as the Gaul Environment Center, the Gaul Business Development Group, and the list goes on. Gaul is very fortunate in that area. So for me who came here in a petrol car tonight, the deployment of EV infrastructure and other market opportunities in Gaul may allow me to drive to another council meeting to stand here and come here in an electric vehicle rather than my petrol car. The community involvement in the development of this climate emergency action plan document has been quite astounding from numerous meetings from dealing with the COVID pandemic workshops the amount of time and hours spent by members have been quite extraordinary and shouldn't go unnoticed it also demonstrates the commitment by the community to take part in this transition to, to reduce emissions on the community side which are quite substantial compared to council emissions and also to take part in the opportunities that arise from council taking emission reduction opportunities and sort of achieving those co-benefits. And then lastly, the point I want to make is that it's the document is designed to prepare the next generation of youth leaders and youth um, a next generation that inhabit the town of Gawler in, an, in achieving an environment that is still sustainable and like what we have today. Otherwise, it will be quite substantially different if climate change goes unchecked. And community has and council has a giant opportunity and, and a fantastic opportunity to reduce emissions to make the town a great place in the future to preserve the environment that we are fortunate to have and to and allow future generations to live sustainably so with that thank you everyone okay thanks jack um there's no other speaker so has anybody got any questions for jack before we move on and Jack, do you want to come back up to the podium and then you can um, answer the questions? Uh, the amount of work that uh, we've done in council, uh, in your opinion, and to the uh, report that you've just uh, mentioned there, 
how do you think we fare and are we heading in the right direction the way we are moving? Okay. Um, I guess in my opinion, I think council has done an extraordinary job to date in sort of taking those first steps. So the document outlines the next few, like the to 2050 net neutrality as a council operation. So it's just outlining the future pathway for council to take from its current point in time. So, you know, we've got solar panels on most infrastructure in the town, here, admin center, but there's opportunities for further deployment of solar, uh, EV fleet. So transitioning from diesel work vehicles to electric vehicles. And there's those opportunities that, you know, are part of the emissions reductions and will have a significant effect towards achieving the 2050 net neutrality that we are aiming for in the document. Okay, thanks, Jack. Uh, yep, yeah, again, yep. Yeah. Uh, we're on the edge of the farming area and some farmers, and I'll say some because it's now been proven they don't have to burn the stubble. There's been many times in the last couple of years that gall has been so covered with smoke, you'd think that the gall was on fire. Um, do you see this? Uh, do you see that as a problem and, and certainly not helping the, the, the way we're trying to head? I mean, we've got nothing to do with the farming area because that's another council, but unless those councils are involved with that, and I'm sure that every one of us have seen this town covered with smoke and, uh, um, you know, it shouldn't be doing anything any good with it. And it's now been proven that farming does not have to burn. They can actually uh, dry sow and all that. That is quite an interesting point. And I guess it highlights the transboundary nature of climate change and sort of the fact that of the area that we live in. So we're not, you know, stuff doesn't happen outside of the town of Gula boundaries and neither does it for other councils. Um, obviously, you know, town of Gula doesn't have the capacity to tell others at, outside of the region what to do, or in many cases. So, you know, Light Regional Council has their climate change consultation tomorrow afternoon. So there's opportunities for council and Gawler community members to have that discussion and sort of go, hey, there's things happening in other areas that are affecting us as community. We'd like to have those discussions. And that's the opportunity that, that collaboration has. And one of the great, great things that climate change has produced is that transboundary collaboration in regions, whether or not it's neighboring or international. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Little. when you drafted this um, this motion tonight or put up was that a consensus of the majority of the of the climate change people or there was some dissension i feel from a personal perspective that the um sort of the final draft is quite a sort of a general consensus by the members of the working group um obviously you know we have had continual discussions over the past probably three, four months when we had the final document over, you know, wording, what are the main points we want to get across and what are the goals that we want to achieve. But there are, you know, still community consultation will play a role in determining the final product that is then endorsed by, you know, council as it's, as its final position. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Jack? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, no, that was it. Okay, thank you. Um, now, moving on to the agenda, any declarations of interest for any of the agenda items tonight? No. Uh, confirmation of minutes, Infrastructure and Environmental Services Committee, 12th of October 2021. Mayor Redmond, you like to move it? And Councillor Davies, you second it? Any discussion? Okay, all those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Now we'll move on to business arising uh, from the minutes. We've got a couple of pages. There. Any questions in amongst all of that? Any questions? Well, I've got a few, <laughs> if I'm allowed to. Okay, the first one I've got about is the irrigation plan update. Um, we've done some work in Pioneer Park and installed some water saving technology. Um, has there been any indication that we've had water savings from that? I'll pass that through to Sam. Oh, 
probably a little too early with respect to Pioneer Park, um, specifically it's only just recently been commissioned and it's early in the irrigation season. Okay. However, anecdotally, where we have installed, we've actually installed these moisture sensors on our um, and rain gauges along our reserves, and there is a significant benefit being received, um, which will probably be reported through to cancel through some of the non-financial indicator um, reports over time. But I can um, certainly, from a staff perspective, we're getting some really good feedback and uh, in respect to how that technology is actually working for us, particularly with that um, moisture within the root zone yep. and using that as a key factor in terms of irrigation. Yep, so getting dead, um, making sure you have to fill the capacity and not going beyond it. Okay, thank you. My other question is just about the Rural Zone Planning and Design Code Amendment. Uh, part seven, um, we're looking at a range of things. At the Climate Emergency um, Plan meeting the other night, we talked about um, uh, car carbon farming carbon sequencing, sequestering carbon in the soil. So will that be part of the, uh, the scope when we're looking at um, a, um, the development down there as a, a, a productive activity that can happen as a viable um, primary production activity? That's carbon farming. Yeah, I haven't quite got... Um... Oh, sorry, Jack. Yeah. Uh, through the chair, <clears throat> we're still we're still looking at that with with the submission that's come through to us at council to to examine, and it's just been um, preliminary. We've just had preliminary discussions internally, and there'll be more to follow through with that. So we'll be coming back with more information. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions on uh, Mr. Cody? Yeah. Um, so just about the Finnish Street multi-story car park toilet. Um, I just note, noted that in the business arising, it's got a status update field that's empty. I'm just wondering, is there a status update? Oh, there we go. <laughs> <in> the room. <clears throat> yeah, sorry, I'll take that one on notice, uh, Councillor Davies, in terms of where staff are at with that particular report. Okay, any, any other questions? Okay, we'll move on to, where am I? Are we up to 7.1 now? Okay, 7.1, this is the southern entry statement of an update on the current establishment of the plannings. And we've got a presentation from Mr. Andrew Feeney, and we've been told it's 10 minutes, so sit back and relax. And I'll be timing you, Andrew, I'll let you know. <laughs> yep, here we go. Uh, Chair, Mayor, Councillors and other people uh, and staff, it's a pleasure to be here and also a pleasure to be working on the, the, the goal entrance. Uh, this is the shortest presentation I've ever had to do, so bear with me and I'll have to, I'd love to be able to give you a, a rundown of everything to do with native grasslands, but we'd be here for about three hours. Um, so I'll, I'll just really quickly get into it. As you can see up there, the, my title picture, uh, picture there is uh, on the western side, uh, just looking across the planting. And the majority of what you can see there is uh, native grasses. There's the odd weed there, but there's the majority of native grasses and similar to what it looks, now, look, it looks like now. I am from Seeding Natives Incorporated, where an environmental charity uh, a not-for-profit that's been running for since 2017. Uh, and we, we are a registered charity, but we've also got the fee-for-service side of the organisation, which, uh, which means that we can actually survive as a, a running business. Native grasslands come in all sorts of forms. So you would be familiar, I, I would assume, with some sort of native grasses or grasslands, uh, whether it be on the roadsides or uh, remnant vegetation. There's, a whole, there's so many different variations. Now, what we've got uh, in front of you on that picture is dominated by uh, just native grasses. So it looks pretty boring. You know, it looks like you could just put some cattle in there or some sheep. That's what most people would say, or, or it needs to be slashed. But then you've got something like that, where it's got native grasses in it, but it's actually, you could almost say it's dominated by flowering forbs or herbs. Uh, this is what I see as something that is 
the could be the future of the the uh, tall entrance. Obviously, you've got all of the grasses that we currently uh, have planted and sown, but at the same time, once we can get on top of the weed load, and weeds are uh, the bane of my existence and everybody else's, but it's also what you have to deal with before you can actually have the end of a, a successful project. That was really quick. <laughs> you more, you're more time. <laughs> <laughs> and 10 minutes left, okay. <laughs> No. Let's go back to. Oh, you're getting it. You're getting snippets of all these things. So I'm, I know it looks like more than ten minutes, but I'm going to go through these things pretty quickly. Yeah. Okay, so there's another picture of just basically just grasses. So this is generally speaking what a lot of a lot of the time people have got. Again, dominated by native grasses. They all look slightly different, but they are all native grasslands. In a vineyard. So in viticulture, um, you're basically, generally speaking, you're going to have, this is a little bit off-putting, but that's all right. So the, uh, the one on the right-hand side there is after flowering, so at about this time of year, and then the one that was on the left-hand side is as it's growing, and so you've got green. So, okay. All right, so we've got two different types of native grasses, and the reason you want both of them is because you've got green all year, you've got flowering at different times of year, and basically it gives you a system that's complete. You, you don't have a system that only has cool season grasses, and you don't have a system that only has warm season grasses. So what we've got is warm season and cool season in together, so you've got green basically all year round. Uh, it's important for fire, um, fire load, it's important for aesthetics. It's important for a whole range of things. But all of these native grasses, so what you see out there, there's any apogon, that is the, uh, you see that on the roadside all the time. Um, that's, that's a summer grass. Kangaroo grass, if everybody's familiar with that, uh, which is on roadsides and all over the place as well, that is again a C4, which is a summer grass. Grows in the heat, loves the heat, flowers, drop seed, you get some rain in summer, green burst, Flowers again, drops more seed. Whereas the cool season grasses, uh, basically they grow in the cooler season and then they flower. And right now they're finishing their flowering. Uh, we're right in the middle of harvest, um, actually at the tail end of the, the cool season harvest. Uh, but you've got your wallaby grasses, your spear grasses, your microlina. I've really got to pick up the pace here. And we've got flowering species. So there's um, a whole range of flowering species that I see would be fantastic on the gall entrance once the weed control is, uh, once the weeds are under control. Look, let's just have a quick look at the native grasses, which are perennial. That guy standing there, this is from the US, but that's a perennial native gra or perennial grass, native in the US. Look at the root system on that perennial grass. Look at what that's doing for not only being able to survive drought, but being able to get down there, it actually builds soil rather than, on the right hand side, you've got annual, uh, which is agriculture, but that's annual grasses, so everything from your, your rye grasses, your silver grasses, your wild oats, all those sorts of things are doing nothing for the soil, but they're ugly and they're doing things, for, uh, even mental health. I hate seeing them on the sides of the road, but they're everywhere. Um, look at the root system on that thing. Uh, it's, the grass itself is like two inches high and then you've got six feet of roots under, underground. Now, this might seem like it's a bit ridiculous, um, mm. and it's from South America, and the grass itself is at the top and it's about a foot high and the rest of it is just its root system. So I'm assuming, I don't know, I'm just assuming that came out of a cliff face. Um, we, where we are right here in the AMLR is a, a, one of the recognised biodiversity hotspots in the country. Um, biodiversity, I, I don't want to even go into this, this is where we start going into the three hour session. Um, but it's really important and when we're talking about the southern entrance, I think we've got to say something to the community. The community are driving past this all the time. We don't want to just show them native grasses. We want to show them a biodiverse system that not only looks good, but is actually really good for, it's an ecosystem, a complete ecosystem, not just part of it. And I, reckon, I think that's really important. So there's a lot of learning that can happen for everybody in this. Um, and that's just a pretty picture. So having appropriate biodiversity, we've got threatened species all over the place in the AMLR. And 
It's our seating native's job, and this is what we're constitutionally uh, going to do, is save threatened species in the AMLR. So, and, and beyond, but let's, that's just one of our things that is in our constitution. And what that means is building a functioning ecosystem from the ground up, and that means starting with the native grassland and then building it to whatever it needs to end up being. And the Gawler entrance, I can see being not only a, a diverse grassland, but the flowering grassland, like the one you saw in one of the earlier pictures. But to get to that, you need to have appropriate site preparation. If you don't have the right site preparation, you don't get the results at the end. Now, you can do um, site preparation that's not the best, and you will get there, but you'll get there slower. With the Gawler entrance, it's uh, roads, are basically a weed highway. Um, with, the thing is with the roadside is if you, um, there are many ways that you can undertake site preparation. That's about a half hour talk. Um, but the way we have undertaken on the Gawler entrance is the best way that we could do on the roadside with the time frame and the budget allowed. And I think we're doing a fantastic job. Um, there are certain weeds that need to be worked on over the next couple of years. But this is not a two year project and then bang, you've got your end product. You've got a five year thing so that you start with your first year, we've had the site preparation, we've had the sowing. Now we're at about the 18 to 20 month mark after sowing. Native grasses are really slow. After 12 months, you've only got a couple of inches. Um, the ones that we've planted from tube stock are obviously bigger because they go in the ground bigger, but native grasses are really slow at establishing. But once they're established, they've got these huge root systems and the plants themselves are big and flowering, dropping seed, building a weed seed, uh, a weed seed bank, building a native uh, seed bank so that when there is attrition, then you have the natives coming up further. So this slide is telling is one of the most important things. It's not about the seed and, and it's about the preparation and the way you're getting to the end product. So you really have to know what you're doing. This is, uh, my, my wife um, hates this, but it's really important. If you're building a sandwich, you start at the bottom piece of bread and you put all your layers on top of it. It's the same as the road. If you don't put the base underneath the bitumen, then the first truck comes along and it goes off the side. You have to put the work in to get the base right, to get the weed control right, get on top of everything, and you have a finished product that's there for good and is there to stay. Um, so this is a site from, I won't put them in the deep end, but my, uh, Mount Barker. Basically, that is the height of me, and we're familiar with this sort of thing all over the place, but that has actually been already been restored. They've already planted all the plant trees and shrubs. And if somebody doesn't come in and manage that, it's not only a fire risk, but look at the biome, it's just huge. And it's, it's an absolute eyesore. Whereas if you go in and put in a native grassland, what, like what we've got at the southern entrance, you've actually already got a greatly reduced management. You, you, you'd be lucky to have to go in there once a year to, uh, at the absolute most once a year to mow it. Uh, and then you may have to go in there and do some occasional spot spraying, but that's just the same as anywhere else. Um, so yeah, that's just, that's the, a picture of after they'd slashed um, and done brush cutting. So the amount of effort that goes into that and being done four or five, six times a year, that's a huge cost. If you've got a native grassland on the ground like that, it could be up to a foot high, um, or even, you know, with the seed heads, but the grasses themselves are actually very low, low fuel load, green, and they don't look unsightly, and they don't, um, so, so basically it's something that aesthetic, very aesthetically pleasing. Management is extremely important. If you do the wrong thing, you can lose it, especially in the establishment phase. This is just a picture of our, one of our management tools, which is a wiper. You can actually set it at a certain height, and we've used this on the entrance, you set it at a certain height and you go and just apply herbicide to a level. You're not spraying it, you're wiping it on the weeds that are at a certain height and you're only taking out those weeds. They drop down, the natives come back up. So it's giving the natives an opportunity to establish appropriately. Um, this is just a, it's a guide, to, don't even worry about the words, it's not about that. What it is, is when people go and mow uh, a park or their front yard, or it doesn't matter where it is, most of the time, they don't want to come back the next weekend and mow it. So they go on the left-hand side. They cut it as low as they can so that it can be a longer time, a time frame before you have to mow it again. But with native grasses, when you cut them, they don't power on and put on growth automatically. They shut down to a degree and say, and protect themselves. They hold themselves for a while and then they slowly come back. 
That's why they're not fantastic for um, high input output agriculture, because they're so slow at putting back on, putting on their growth. So you actually need to protect the crown of the grass and cut it high, at least 50 mil. Um, so management is very important. If you cut it down to your 20, 30, 35 mil in the middle of summer, you'll lose the lot. So management is really important. And that's got everything to do with the weed control. So weed control, you've got to get that right. Management, you've got to get that right. All of these things have to be right, and we are on the way to having the an absolutely beautiful grassland at the Gaul entrance. And I see that the flowering herbs that I was pointing out earlier in the presentation will set it off and every, there's not a person that, oh, there always is, but I was gonna say there's not a person that couldn't be happy to see blue, yellow, purple, and white flowers at, uh, in spring. People go to Western Australia from all over the world to see the wildflowers. I come to Gawler to see the wildflowers in the Gawler entrance. Thank you. Okay, oh, thank you. <laughs> Any questions for Andrew? Um, yep. Brian, there we go. Because what you told us tonight is, is something that's blown me out of the water. I never knew anything about this because I've been one that's been critical about the, the fact of spending $400,000 on an entry, um, entry exit into this town. And tonight I spoke to a fellow councillor because at the moment the phone calls are running red hot that somebody or some idiot is going to throw a match in there and it's going to burn. But you've highlighted it and so did uh, Councillor Hughes about the fact that native grasses don't burn, they actually like smoulder. Is that, is that a fact? Yeah, that's right. So you've got the... Oops. There you go. <laughs> so the seed heads, uh, when they're dry, they will... Uh, they'll combust extremely quickly because they are dry. The rest of the grass itself is green. None of them are dying down to what uh, oats and phalaris and all these other things. That, that is a huge amount of fuel sitting there. As soon as you put a match to it, you've got to step back and you've got to fight it from a distance. When the Cudley Creek fires came through one of our production areas in Kenton Valley, there's, uh, this gentleman has a 10 hectare property and our little area is only about a thousand square metres and just thick with native grasses. When his paddock had the fire going through it, he only had two inches, an inch to two inches of growth on his paddock, phalaris, coxfoot, weeds. He couldn't stand 20 metres from it without feeling the heat. He had to like point his hose at it up in the air to try and hit it. When it hit the native grasses, he was walking up to it and standing on it and putting it out with his feet. So as far as the intensity of the fire and what the fire movement and the way it actually, uh, but the behavior is completely different to exotic grasses that carry a huge fuel load. You know, you can have a fuel load of native grasses from anywhere from two to five tons per hectare. Uh, you can have Phalaris right up to the, you know, in the low twenties. So that, that's a huge difference, especially for fighting the fire. Uh, I'd much rather fight a two ton a hectare or three ton hectare fire than a um, 20 ton hectare fire. Mm. Any other questions for Andrew? Oh, another one? Uh, and uh, question about the ongoing support of, of, of having that, uh, like is this a, another three-year project or, uh, you know, because you've got to keep continually each year after a harvest or whatever, uh, be able to uh, regenerate it or, or what you were saying with that machine that you've got there? That's just about the weeds. So uh, really we need to get on top of it so that the weeds have been reduced to a point where the natives are dominating. At the moment, especially on the flat, on the mounds, we're winning, we've, we've won. The grasses are dominating and they are doing fantastically. Uh, on the flats, we've got uh, a, a huge populations of, of weeds that we are dealing with and that's the biggest management at the moment is dealing with those weeds. Uh, once we're on top of that, exha exhausting the seed, we're trying to stop everything from seeding and just, you know, making sure that things germinate, the weeds that is, and then you get on top of them, get rid of them, and that gives the opportunity for the, the natives to come up and actually take those spaces that at the moment the weeds uh, do take. So that is a process where this is the one of the things that takes five years from beginning to having your finished product. Uh, but when we're talking about the, when I mentioned about the flowering herbs and it's in the report as well about the forbs, 
they can go in as, as, as you're able to. So there might be on one side where the uh, school is, on the um, eastern side, that might be able to receive the flowering herbs before the other side because it, 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 it probably will. It's just when you get to a certain point where the weeds have been reduced to a, a, an appropriate level, then you can start introducing the other flowering herbs. Tony, have you got a question? Uh, yes. Whoops, sorry. So, so just around um, the management of the weeds, I guess I'm not an expert in weed management, but is that something that... Um, would be easier if it was controlled beyond, I guess, the boundaries of that area in particular. I'm just wondering, is there any, I guess, bad flow and effects from sort of poorer maintenance up the road, for example? That's a really good point because that's the the weed highway. Any road is a weed highway. You know, if you're in the middle of, um, well, whether it be summer or even now when it's a windy day, you're, you're driving along and there's all these weeds, that, there's these you know, Father Christmases and everything just blowing all over the place on a windy day. And that's just stopping on the roadside all over the place. So they, they are going to spread. They do move directly from uh, right next to it and move in. But the whole idea is that we acknowledge that weeds are always going to be something that you're fighting against. So you go for density of natives. So you, if you have it dense enough, then they, the, the weeds can't even grow. There's no opportunity for them to actually get a foothold. So uh, it's not just a theory, it, it is actually, if you have dense stands of natives, you, you can actually hold out the weeds. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Um, okay. Mayor Reardon, you got a question? Okay, thank you, Andrew. We've, any other questions? No, okay, thank you, Andrew, no, wonderful. Okay, we'll go back to our agenda. We've got an officer's recommendation. Mayor Redman, do you wanna, and do you wanna to speak to that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Andrew, for your really good, concise. Um, it was a bit um, challenging, so you did really, really well with that presentation. <laughs> well done. Uh, I, I applaud you for what you're doing around the southern entry statement, and I can't wait to see the flowering um, natives. I think that's going to look stunning. And if only we could get uh, the Department of Transport to manage their arterial roads and their weed management, we'd all be a lot better off. Uh, so it is a lesson for them, but um, they don't seem to be getting the message. We keep bringing it up uh, that uh, they need to manage their roadside uh, vegetation a lot better than they do, and maybe uh, they could invest in a major project to do native grasses. Wouldn't that be amazing? Um, and then we wouldn't have, you know... Uh, a hilly of fire because that came from the Northern Expressway. It came from a fire at that roadside. Um, so, yeah, it's. Uh, I, th I think it's a really exciting project. I think you're doing some really, really good work. Thank you. Uh, um, and thank you to staff for uh, being diligent in this space. Um, yeah, so I just um, um, hope people support the, which is effectively a noting motion. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking for a seconder for this motion. Uh, David, Councillor Hughes. Uh, yeah, thank you, Andrew. Uh, I think you actually explained the fire and stuff like that really well. Um, I, and I don't think, unfortunately, a lot of um, people realise that you know, a lot of these grasses are green during summer and to actually start a fire, that they, they won't really start it. It's the wild oats and, and other weeds that actually start fires. And, it actually gives firefighters the chance to actually put out fires and control fires uh, when they do get to native grasslands and, and native areas because they do burn so much far, uh, slower than the fast burning weeds. Um, and the other issue, um, which probably can take hours to explain, is that the native grasses that have, uh, it's called intertussic spaces, and they're the spaces between the grasses. And in that area, is just full of insects, uh, native insects, native bees, small lizards, um, all these animals that actually live in the intertussic spaces, which is really important for the grasslands. So um, they do have this huge biodiversity of other species that uh, sort of rely on native grasslands. And unfortunately, in South Australia, we have lost uh, a lot of our grasslands because they were seen as fantastic grazing area for cattle and sheep. And, 
and then introduced pastures and phalaris and things like that were, were planted and, and taken over those areas. So uh, we do actually have a lot less native uh, grasslands. So um, the whole understanding and actually you know, people sort of seeing them not as weeds, but as native uh, species and you know, really important as Andrew pointed out for that Mount Barker uh, example where we've got um, the upper story, but the understory is just all weeds. And uh, I think quite often we don't get that understory correct with our um, planting out areas at all. So it just highlights how important that understory is and, and getting that right. And once we've got the weeds under control, getting down the native daisies and, um, and other native forbs and stuff like that can be a lot more attractive to the average um, a resident of Gawler than, than grasses, unfortunately, because they just don't understand and don't understand how important and the fact that they are you know, um, really good at uh, helping in fires and things like that as well. So there's a lot of educational benefits in this uh, space. So, so it's really good. So yeah, happy to support the officer's recommendation. Yep. Any other discussion? Council Little? Yeah, I'll be speaking against the recommend against a recommendation for a couple of statements that were said by the mayor until we can get dip tie and all that organized and look after the roadways we're just going to keep wasting ratepayers money on trying to do a great idea that's not going to consist to be a great idea when the state government's organization is not contributing to that classic was the fires that was brought up before you can drive around that road now i went there today it's a disgrace it's not our part the council part is quite fine, but it's the other part we have no control over. So I just, I like the concept and I like it where we control the lands, but at the moment we don't control that space. So I, I can't vote for it, sorry. Um, yeah, look, I mean, I'm happy to support it. It is a noting motion. We're not making a decision either way. Um, I think, yeah, it is, look, my, uh, my concern, I guess, is on a, on a political level in a year, we're gonna have an election. This is a five year cycle um, and the average person seems to um, be very disappointed in the current state of the, um, of the rusty shovels as they call them. Um, so my concern would be that a new council comes in and says, well, we're, we're uh, gonna, you know, we're gonna revoke this, we're gonna cut this off. Um, and I think that's something we need to, um, I guess, maybe have, make sure that at the new council, this kind of presentation comes back again um, and people are clear on what a five, five year process means. Um, because yeah, I think a lot of people have had no idea of any of this until, um, you know, just now. So um, yeah, we need good communication here because otherwise people might come, come back a year from now and say, well, doesn't look like it's finished now. So um, yeah, so that's my only concern, but um, it was a good presentation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and, and certainly I'll, I'll lead on from uh, what Councillor Davies said is the better communications. Without a doubt, as I said before, where were you two years ago? I mean, what we've heard tonight, a very professional report, a very professional put uh, forward tonight by uh, Mr. Gleghorn. Um, and to do with, with, the, with the area itself, as elected member, when we're out in the street or we're going or, or we're driving down the road, there's a few comments that get thrown, not, not uh, every now and then, nearly every day. What is that? What does it represent? Where does it say, welcome to Gawler? It's an exit and it's an entry. It's not only an entry, it's an exit as well. Farewell, I'll see you next time or whatever. There's no signage. I mean, the amount of times that I've put up and said, please, let's put a sign. Let's explain what Andrew has done and so forth. I mean, the community wants to know what they are because I can't, I didn't write down the right words that, that people have been to saying to me. They don't say them in those clear words and that sort of thing because they say, what a waste of money, 400 grand and what have we got? So signage, I will support it because I want to see it move forward. But 
I know, as Councillor David said, that this is for noting, but should there not be a, a figure amount of what the cost is going to be over the next, as Andrew said, it's a five year term, and we've got the uh, budget workshop tomorrow night. There's nothing in there uh, uh, about this. So maybe if we could have some sort of a costing uh, f for Andrew or whatever. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Sorry, go on. Yep. Uh, but uh, if, uh, um, I mean, it's got to be a cost. Andrew doesn't work for nothing. And uh, do you, Andrew? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'll be supporting it, but I think let's get the signage up there. The community wants to know. We know the government are not doing their job. You know, they've lost all their lawnmowers. They've sold all their V8 supercar gear. They've probably sold their their um, their lawnmowers as well. So uh, the government's not doing the right thing, but we as a council need to get representation that our community backs us with what is it out there? Are they rusty fingernails? Are they play plough shares or whatever it may be? No, they're our exits and our entries into this town. And we've got to be, feel proud of it, as I feel proud to hear Andrew give his talk here tonight. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Oh, you got anything? Okay. I'd just like to make some comments. Um, thank you, Andrew, for your presentation. I've actually worked in this space for a lot of years. I worked for one council managing their native grasslands. And when they I suppose when they manage properly, they are a really um, beautiful aesthetic. They have a beautiful aesthetic appeal. And the comments that I would I would get uh, for the areas that I manage, people loved them. People loved the grasslands. They loved the fact that it was green in summer and winter, the C4, C3s and C4 grasses, as Andrew was saying. Um, and also note that our council is already doing a lot of a lot of this out on the rural area. They're slashing the um, the verges, and when you slash the verges, you basically slash out the uh, annual weeds, and the native grasses can come through. So we're actually doing that on the rural areas. So that's actually making it safer in the rural areas. So we need to be sort of aware of that as well. Um, I think that when we can get the daisies, the little little flowering daisies in, it looks absolutely a picture. I've got it at my place. It looks like a Monet picture. It is so beautiful with the native grasses and all the, all the little flowering um, daisies, et cetera. So when it happens, it looks, it looks fantastic. So I'm quite happy to support this. I think it's a great, um, it's a great, great initiative and it's a great example for our community, um, not only because of fire, but also for the biodiversity outcomes. And we will get more biodiversity outcomes. And that's something we really need to be protecting is, is protecting and encouraging our biodiversity within our town. And that spills out into the wider community. So I'm happy to support this. Any other comments? Me? Gonna... Okay, happy to rack up. Okay, I'll put that. I thought you could speak, yep. I just want to address some of the comments <coughs> that were made. So I know uh, in regard to Council Little's comments around how uh, the weed highway will uh, dominate, I'm pretty sure I heard Andrew, you said that if, uh, if we get um, the natives dominating, the weeds can't get in. That's right. <coughs> so we actually, and that's where the five year program comes in. And I think we do need to think long term. I think we need to stay the course and be strong. But I think there's also an opportunity for education. We've got extra information now. So I think there's a real opportunity to make people more aware of the opportunities, what native grasses and the biodiversity, the flowers, the, the, the flora, the fauna that will come and live in this area. There's all sorts of opportunities there that could showcase Gawler as um, you know, a biodiversity uh, hotspot as per the, the map that you put up, which is what we're supposed to be. So um, in regard to the cost, it is actually mentioned on page 22 as a recurrent mm -hmm. budget item. And that means that there will be ongoing maintenance, there will be more planting, and we will get to a point where it's going to look absolutely magnificent. So I think Councillor Little, your concerns will be addressed over the long term, and um, I look forward to that. So um, I'll wrap it up now. Thank you. Okay, I'll put that motion. All those in favour? All those against? It's carried. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. That's it. <laughs> okay. Seven point two appointment of deputy chairperson. 
And we all read the terms of reference. The, um, terms of reference. Now, any nominations? David, you need nominated. Okay. Would anybody else like to nominate? Okay. Would someone like to second that? So it's moved. David, self-nominating and seconding uh, Deputy Mayor Brian Sample. Because there's no other, no need for a vote. <laughs> All those in favour? Show of hands. Carried unanimously. Thank you. Well done, David. Okay, 7.3, um, 7 King Street Heritage Wall Grant application. Uh, now, do we need anything from the officers as a bit of an interlude into this? Or everyone's happy that they've read the, read the agenda and happy? And what pass it on to maybe Mr. Delena? In the instance of Daly Street, the council's covering the cost through its supplying its own barriers per se. Any questions? You want to... Yep, there we go. Yep. I'm happy to put uh, a motion one and two, the first two A, not the second two A, 28,000. And if I can speak to that. Yep. <clears throat> um, I, think, I think this is a really good report. Thank you uh, for the report. Um, I think the reason I've picked that first option is because there's other applications in the system and I think that if we go to the, for the second option, we'll run out of money. Um, so I think to be sensible, I think the first option uh, is, I think is a better, a better outcome for all concerned, including other applicants. So that's happy to test the waters. I yep. don't know what other people think, but um, I think that might be a better way forward given that we've got other applicants wanting to access uh, the scheme. Okay, so that's... So that's the 28,000 one. 28,000. Now, we've got a seconder for that. Diane, you have this. You want to speak to that? Um, I agree with that. Um, first of all, council's already spent money by putting in the barricades and things like that. And also, the people themselves have put up the concrete wall. You don't, you don't usually apply for a grant after you've, for something you've already done. I've never heard of that happening before. Um, but also, I agree with, um, with the mayor that um, if we use up all the money on one building, mm. then other people miss out. And I think that that's just a fair way to go. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Little, did you want to speak? Okay. You want to sing it? Yep. yep. Any other discussion? Any, okay. No discussion. Um, Mayor, do you want to? No. Okay. I'll put I'll put that motion. All those in favour? All those against? It's carried. Thank you. Okay, 7.4, Household General Waste Special Circumstances Exemption. Mayor, you want to? Yep. Let's try it again. There you go. Who's got, oh, you've got to turn, there you go. I don't know. I have to turn dial oh, to turn right. you on. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm happy to move the officer's recommendation. I think it's fairly straightforward and, and speaks for itself, so I won't yep, um, okay. bore people. Second, Deputy uh, Mayor Sample, yep. Any other discussion? Okay, I'll put that, all those in favour? Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, where did it come out? Got to, 
which is that. What page is that? 36. Okay, 7.5, Gawlet Mill in Bridge Balustrade, new design options. Have we all read that? Um, Di, you want to move some questions? Or? No, I'm happy to move it, albeit that I'd like to <coughs> just make some comments. Yep. Um, I, I understand the basics of having to put it on the inside of the bridge for safety reasons so people don't climb over it. Um, but I do think that it's not going to be quite so invisible that way. It would have been better to have been on the other side of the thing. Also, we don't actually have a picture of it with another fence behind it. We've only got the picture of it by itself. Um, if, 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 well, I have moved this, but yeah, if, yeah. If, <clears throat> if we were to get a mesh, um, as in um, on page, 39, but one that was closer together so people couldn't get their foot in it. Um, a bit more like a security door type thing. Um, that would probably be more invisible. And does the mesh have to be white? Or does the mesh, can the mesh be black? Or will the black fade with the sun? Okay, I had exactly the same question, so I'll pass it over to Mr. Delina. Yep. Through you, Chair. Um, we did speak to a heritage consultant, Douglas Alexander, in this space, and his preference for it is galvanised woven mesh in the sense that that's the most transparent colour. And in terms of being able to preserve the visibility of the heritage fabric behind, in terms of the colour of that rail. So his preference is certainly for it to be galvanised. And that's actually similar to what's going in the King Street Bridge as well. Okay, I've got to move it now. Is there a seconder for this? Tony, you, you want to speak to this? You don't, okay. David, do you want to speak to this? Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I think there is actually a photo on page 42 at the bottom. It shows the woven mesh and you can actually see the rails coming through um, the report. Um, yeah, I'm... I'm happy to support this, um, it's the staff recommendation. It's, it's probably a pity that Councillor Shanks isn't here to, to actually hear his ideas on this as well, uh, which would have been handy. But um, yeah, I, I think um, that doesn't look too bad at all at the bottom of page 42, so happy to support it. Yep. Any other comments? Mayor Redman. Yeah, I'm going to speak against it. I think it's going to look terrible. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay. Thanks. <laughs> right. Any other comments? I'm going to have a vote in a second. Any other comments? You happy for me to put the vote down? Okay. All those in favour? All those against? It's carried. Thank you. All those in favour, please stand. So, Councillor Davies, Councillor Valonga, Councillor Little, Councillor Hughes, Councillor Brazer and Councillor Posh, all in favour. Those against, Mayor Redmond and Deputy Mayor Samble. Thank you. The vote, yeah. What are you saying? It's, yeah, it's been passed, yep, yep. Oh, sorry, I thought he was, oh. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> the oh, 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 yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, 7.6, draft climate emergency plan. Now, everyone's had a read of this. Where are we going with this one? Councillor Davies, do you want to? Yeah, I, well, I can move it. Um, I think this is, um, yeah, this is something that I've been involved in the, the committee since it was launched and have been um, following it with, with interest. Um, it's, I think, um, a really conceptually interesting plan because it rec it's something that recognises, there are councils that have had their, their own emissions and, and that looked at and looked into, oh, should we get electric cars and this kind of thing. But 
you know, 99% of the emissions in Gola are from the community, um, just by the, just the raw nature of if you've got 20,000 houses and they've all got cars and they're all using electricity, that's just a, you know, that's a huge chunk of it. And what this does is it recognises we need to be able to support them um, in, um, in transitioning to a better system because a lot of them are, would be happy to do so, but as you know, are still not sure about the maths of it all a lot of the time that, you know, I've talked to a lot of people who've said, oh, well, you know, electric car sounds interesting, but I don't know if it, you know, don't know about what the long-term costs, what the maintenance, um, you know, and all of this is just stuff that I think it's valuable for us as a council to be, um, you know, providing, providing information, helping people. Um, and that's in a way, you know, part of it, it's good for the council to lead the way and it's good for us to be able to say, oh, we're going to save $100,000 every year on LED lights and all that kind of things. Those are victories for the council. Um, but I think the, the broad scope of it um, on a community level as well is what makes it particularly impressive. So happy to move this. Thank you. So I'm going to signal, you want to sign it? No, you want to speak to that? Um, yes, um, I'll second this. I actually commend the report. Um, it's very realistic. It could have been, you know, we want climate change and we're going to do this and do that and do something else and there's no way council can support it. So in that form, I actually think it's a very re realistic report, something that we can work on, um, work with and work on. And yes, yeah, so I commend it. Any other comments? David, you got a comment? Um, yeah, I'm, um, yeah I, I sort of agree with what uh, the mover and the seconder have sort of said, but I, I don't know whether as us as all councillors actually understand the plan as, as much as we could and whether you know, if there was a councillor and staff workshop on this, um, the benefits that we could get. I mean, that may be something we could do after we've got public consultation, but um, yeah, I think it's really important that as councillors, we actually own this as well as our community. Um, so yeah, I'd even like to see a communications plan on this and engagement plan, um, how we're gonna get ownership um, of this plan to um, quite a number of our community. Um, there's already been comments um, being made that you know, you know, we are stepping outside of some of our role. Um, in this space, um, but I think you know, what council has done so far with um, has been really good, and it's actually been in a lot of cases a cost saving in a couple of years. Um, so, so we've actually been doing a lot of this work uh, in our community. Maybe not selling that so well to the rest of the community, uh, which is really important. Um, but um, we are already doing this. But I do think some sort of workshop. Uh, with uh, staff elected members is really important. And uh, whether that be after or, or before it goes to community consultation, it's always probably the worst time of year to go out to community consultation um, this, this time of year as well. Um, I think it's probably actually better to go out probably February um, and uh, whether you know, if the mover and second want to have a workshop before that. Uh, um, but um, I, I, I think uh, from my reading, there's a lot of achievable things in the plan, and I think you know, council can get a lot of runs on the board, but um, we actually have to understand the costs and actually have to have our community on board uh, with it as well. So I think that's what I'd be aiming for with a um, workshop with staff and the um, councillors to sort of understand it. But um, I do think it, it is achievable as... Uh, Councillor Fraser has said so, um, but there is a lot of costs and I think we need to have that some of that costed and we also need ownership of our community um, in this whole process. So um, that communications plan and that engagement is really, really important um, to actually drive this. And you know, it, it may, uh, if we do get enough community engagement actually drive things differently too and uh, be part of that engagement. So um, I don't know if the mover and second want to um, have a workshop or to talk about it, but that's my yeah, look, before, before community consultation. 
Yeah, okay. Do you want to add that as a third? Yeah. yeah how does that work? Is that the time you're going to give? Yeah. Yeah, just swap them around and then, so we have a workshop with um, staff and councillors just so we get our heads around it and then, yeah, yeah, that would be good. Uh, probably January sometime, or mid January, because it's best to go out later, not not to start community consultation in January because no one's around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we we do come back later. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's it. yeah. We just may change that January, February to February, March or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, both happy with that? Okay, thank you. In, okay, any other comments, me? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you to everyone involved in um, the development of this draft plan. I, there are a couple of things in here, like goal eight, where we've got a target of 223 for 100% renewable electricity. I think that's, I don't know if that's achievable. Um, there's a lot in here that is achievable, but I think that I'm really, really keen to see what people think of um, the achievability of that, but also the cost of that. And I think also as councillors, the new local government reforms have included principles to be observed by council and that section eight, one of IA, and it seeks to balance the provision of services, facilities and programs with the financial impact of the provision of those services, facilities and programs on ratepayers. So that's a must, that's not a maybe. Uh, we have to take that into consideration. So I think a workshop's actually not a bad idea. Um, it helps us understand so that when we're uh, uh, providing feedback and getting and engaging with our community. We've got some data and we've got some costs uh, that we can actually say. And we can also talk about the efficiencies and some of the savings uh, that we've achieved through advocacy and, and various various um, activities that we've done already. So I think, um, yeah, I think overall it's, it's a reasonable plan, but I think we need to understand some of the uh, perhaps areas that maybe we could tweak in that plan so that it becomes a plan that we can deliver in entirety rather than just bits and pieces. So um, I'd like to see a plan that we can deliver the entire plan. Yep. Um, so yeah, I, I'm happy to support um, it going out to public consultation. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Brian, you've got, yep. Yeah, uh, I, I agree, especially with what Councillor Hughes said about the time factor, um, you know, we're going into, January, February, and the report that's been put together by uh, Tim and uh, the, with the help of Catherine and Jack, um, and, and, and the enthusiasm coming from young people like Jack here tonight, um, to get out there in the community uh, and to be able to promote it and get the community behind, we've definitely got to watch uh, what we commit monetary-wise. I, I, I think we all understand that clearly, but if you look at page um, 57, uh, to Mayor Karen's messages there regarding the dot points. They're just so valid, and, and that's exactly what it's all about, and it gets back to what Councillor Davies said. It's called communications. We've got to do better with communications to the community to get for the community to get behind what we're trying to do. And that doesn't seem to be happening too good at the moment. And um, so uh, I, I certainly support it, and, I, and I'd like to see elected members supporting it because we have to do something. I mean, you know, we know uh, the way things are going um, in our country, in our world to the, uh, at the moment, and at least we can start somewhere. And I, I believe we're on the right track. And uh, thanks to Tim and um, um, to Jack and Catherine and everybody else that's involved with uh, the committee and to, to bring this to the fore so that we can work with it. But we have to have communication and promote it out there in the community. Yep. Any other comments? I'll, I'll, I'll before you, I'll just um, look. Thank you. Thank you. Look, I um, I've been working on this for a number of years, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
There was a very prominent council in Victoria that had a climate emergency plan. It went to the community, it was, was passed by council, it went to the community, um, and then in the end, the community didn't quite, uh, we actually they rejected basically. Um, and I don't want to see that happening here at Gawler. I want to see that we have a plan that can be adopted by the community because they, you know, they're going to take the lion's share of, of doing this because that's 99% of the um, of the emissions. So I think by having a good work, having a workshop, so we as elected members get our heads around it, we understand fully, we understand the implications, we can then endorse it eventually and then go to consultation and then we can talk about it as well and um, enthusias enthusiastically support it um, once we know, once we've got our heads around it, et cetera, et cetera. So, I don't, want to, I don't want to see a repeat of what happened in this other council. I won't mention them, um, but I, that, was a, um, that wasn't very good, I don't think. And I don't want to see, I wouldn't like to see that repeated in our council. So I'll be supporting this motion. Thank you. Now, any, now, Cody, do you want to finish off? Yep. Yeah, uh, I guess for my closing um, statement, I guess I'll just cover the, yeah, the, look, I've also been seeing the, uh, you know, the councils do the roads, rates and rubbish, you know, kind of what are they doing getting involved in this? And I just want to reiterate that this is, this is council business. Um, how we spend our electricity and our water and all that is very deeply council financial business, um, especially. Um, and we've been making, you know, some great, some great savings. We've got some great plans for things that will mean that in the long term, we're going to be saving a lot of money, um, just even on the, and just, just stability in general, just, you know, canopy cover and native grasses and all this all, all tie into land that isn't going to take, you know, 30 years from now, they won't be like, oh, we've had to keep maintaining this the whole time. Like, there's a lot of costs that are going to drop off from the course of us doing the right thing now. Um, and so this, yeah, just to reiterate, this is, you know, this is council business um, and we, yeah, and, and it is just better, it's better for everyone in the town um, if we can get this um, all over the line. So yeah, I'll move this motion. Okay, no discussion, I'll put that motion. All those in favour? Those against? Well, there's none. Carried unanimously. Thank you. Okay, 7.7. 7. I've got to announce it first. <laughs> Greater Adelaide Cycleway Consultory cons Consultation Summary and Design Updates. Now, Mayor, do you want to move that? Do you want to speak to that? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I'd like to move the officer's recommendation. Thank you for the report. Uh, it's an excellent report. Um, and it's an excellent project, and I love the fact that they're changed. We, you know, it's recommended that we change the name so we understand where it is, which is Gawler. Um, I, I think that uh, the original design works. I think Gawler's not easy to put a cycle way through. Uh, there are some challenges, but I think uh, this is a really good way forward. Uh, so. Um, I'm not, I'm not a good cyclist, so it might even get me cycling um, at times, <laughs> depending on the safety. But I think this is really encourages safety. It uh, gets it off the main roads, which is really vital because of our traffic that we have. Um, and I think it also uh, allows people to be um, healthier, have a greater sense of well-being when they get out and about. It is, we do have a beautiful town. And uh, getting out on a walking or cycling really allows you to enjoy that. Uh, so, yeah, I do commend this motion. Thank you. Okay. Would someone like to, anyone, second, David, you want to second this? You want to speak to this? Oh. Thank you. Um, yeah, I agree with the, the Mayor. Um, I think it's been really well done by staff and everyone else involved. Um, really commendable. Um, and the amount of feedback and um, consultation, I think it's been done well. It's a good example um, of really good project management. So yeah, commend everyone involved. It's, it's been a really good um, uh, team effort by um, you know, the staff and, and everyone involved. Uh, so yeah, I'm really happy to uh, second it and 
I think it's 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 gone very well. So yeah, it's it's a great example of of consultation and, and getting some good uh, you know tweaks and changes and things like that as well along the way. So that's a good good project. Any other comments? Yep, Ron. Yes, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, here I go again, I know, on communication and signage. I met a group of uh, cyclists here a while ago, and uh, I noticed that yourself and Councillor Hughes weren't amongst them, so you must have slept in that morning. <laughs> but basically, uh, they said, oh, go, how are you going, Sambo? Yeah, good. Can you tell us where this cycle trail is? Because we haven't been able to find out uh, where the trail goes, you know, and oh, I was there trying to explain it to them. I probably led them up the garden path, but that's beside the point about how it goes right through and then goes on to the uh, Stuart of Grady uh, line. And um, uh, they said signage was bad and communication to when people want to come out and uh, come off the what's the what's the one through the Adelaide Hills that. Um, named after the lady. Uh, um, Amy Gillett? Uh, uh, yeah, Amy Gillett, um, and so forth, to link in. And uh, on a conversation I had with Bim Lange, the Mayor of um, uh, Barossa, said the same thing, that the signage needs to be upgraded. Everybody's spending money on it and doing, you know, as we're saying here in this particular motion and support, because we've got that money, the $678,000 to support that through that gross grants fund. So that's fantastic. But when we do that, we must include signage and uh, handout literature yep. because we lack there, I believe. But okay. I'll certainly support the motion. Yep. Good. On. Any other comments? Actually, I've got a couple of questions. Um, I'll over to Mr. Delina. Um, can you comment on David? Is it David Lane? Because it's an issue in here about, uh, about that. Do you want to you comment on that? Oh, thank you, through the chair. Um, as part of the consultation, we have had a um, some pretty strong positions with respect to use of that lane by. It's actually a private lane. It's owned by um, Mr. Jeff Clark, who lives adjoined adjacent the lane. This lane is actually located between the Gore Admin Centre car park, and I suppose immediately. South, uh, south of that and connects into David Street. Um, it is a private lane. However, since 1886, Council has had a free and unrestricted right of way for the public to use that for you know, all sorts of vehicles, horses, carts, and whatever was in the original um, uh, right of way um, deed. The, there is, we have a legal right to access, a public have legal right to access that. Um, notwithstanding, myself and the CEO have met with Mr. Clark and his partner on site. They've got some pretty strong views. Um, we've sought to look at other alternatives. Um, there is an alternative where you could run the path through the car park at the Gordon Administ Administrative Centre. There's some pros and cons associated with that. Um, certainly, um, not in excess, so none of those are better than the alternative to run up what is, you know, we have legal access to do and it's currently been enjoyed by the community today. Um, so on that basis, we're proposing to proceed as per the consultation route. Um, and uh, as of last night or today, I was advised that the um, adjoining property owner, Mr. Clark, will be making a deputation to the council when it's considered on the 21st of December. Okay. Any, any other questions on that on that issue for Sam? Actually, I've got another question. Um, could you just explain the connection from the end of Padnoster Road to the start of the Stuart O'Grady Bikeway? Because it does go over the two wheels road. There's a lot of truck. Yep. Correct. Thank you. Uh, through the chair. Um, so you look back at the uh, project documentation in that space. The um, Stuart O'Grady bike path terminates at a, um, a dead end road called, I think it's Weaver Weaver Road, mm. um, just off Two Wheels Road. Um, from that point along Two Wheels Road, on both sides of Two Wheels Road, across the bridge, there are existing bicycle lanes, dedicated bicycle lanes. So what we're proposing is just some signage, and there's signage along the whole route, mind you, wayfinding signage to direct 
so the whole way and um, providing um and that came out of also the the consultation in terms of the this, what sorts of information people would like on the signs in terms of access to toilet facilities, town centre, um, um, special features in the town of Gawler. Um, so, and distances. So all of that will be on the signage. So effectively, it's, to answer your question, um, Councillor Kosh, it's signage from that point, directing to the existing bike lanes and then on to Paternoster. Okay, thank you. Right, any other questions before I put this motion? So who's moved it? Oh, Mayor did, yep. Do you want to um, say more? <laughs> okay, I'll put that motion. All those in favour? All those against? Okay. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you, David. <laughs> but you're going to vote against it. What about a division? Then you would have been in trouble. <laughs> right. What's next? Seven point eight. Uh, policy review. Landscape verge area for past residents and tree planting and new developments. Mayor, yeah, you want to have a chat about that? <laughs> I'm happy to move, but I've got um, two po dot points that I'd like to add to the landscaping verge areas footways by residents policy um, or just verge areas. Yeah, you've added the word footways. Have you crossed it out? You've crossed it out. Um, and those two dot points are uh, that council maintain a register of permits and be available for public uh, on the public register. And another point, which could be 1.8 and 1.9, staff provide an annual report of this policy and its application. Uh, and I'll just talk to that. I think this is a really good update. My understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, um, uh, I'm not sure whose uh, uh, policy portfolio it is, Sam. Um, the insurance, the public liability insurance has been removed because it used to be $600 a year. So that's now been removed, which is a really good step forward. People want to plant their virgins. Um, so I think this is a really good step forward. Um, I'll leave the way the Section 221. I believe it's $80. Is it $80? $84. So I, I, I'll do that first point too, and we can deal with the second point um, as a separate motion, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, because I think that probably needs a bit of discussion. Um, so yeah, I am hoping that we can add those two dot points so that we just have a register of permits that we have a report back to council so that we can see one, whether people are taking up the verges and planting them and two, whether they're planting them in accordance with the policy, which is quite important uh, that we get people to use their verges and uh, uh, look after the verges in various ways, but within the confines of this policy. So it does help us understand if we have an annual report or an annual register, or, you know, uh, annual uh, information report that allows us to understand that this is actually working rather than just being a policy that nobody even understands or uses. Yep. So that's my intention for putting then those extra dot points in. So, so you would, want that included into this motion? Um, it yeah. would be included in the policy, policy as a point yeah. eight, one point eight, and one point nine. So we maintain a register of permits, okay. and we have uh, an annual report of the policy and its application. Okay, as amended. Okay. As one point eight, one point nine of the policy. Okay. Um, so it's as amended. Yep. And yeah, um, I'll leave recorded? it at that. As Thank amended. you. Yep. Would someone like to second that with the amendments? Di, you want to speak to it? Yeah. Really good policy, and I'm really happy to see that the cost is going. I think more people will um, take it up if they don't have to pay to do it. Um, I would like to just point out, though, something that um, I've been um, speaking about um, is 1.4 about um, the area must have a clear non-landscape width of 1.5 for a standard footpath. Um, and I think that we need to be very um, mindful of that. Um, there is a property um, at um, Gawler East that I've been speaking to the CEO <laughs> about, which is, is really bad. And they actually have two, they have concrete and metal. 
So mm -hmm. it's not just one thing that goes right across the footpath, it's two. And um, we do need to stipulate, a lot of people are just going to do it without uh, applying, you know, so we have to sort of be mindful of that too. I guess that's more work for staff um, to make sure that people are doing it correctly. Yep. But um, overall, it's a good policy. Okay. So you're seconding that? Yep. Okay, I just need to clear that up. So we're just voting on that first motion to start with, aren't we? Any other comments? Brian, you want to? Mr. Chairman, um, regarding uh, existing trees or bushes that are already on the verge, um, I mean, is it going to be a, a simple thing? I mean, sadly, a lot of people say that it's very hard to be able to communicate with council as regards to getting information as to what they're allowed to do and so forth, because there's a couple of people around Gawler that uh, uh, plant and maintain the Gawler hybrid bottle brush in the way they should be because they always look neat. They're cut back at regularly and everything at their expense. That's one good thing. But um, uh, my wife and I drove around on Sunday and uh, had a look at the streets around here and then to the subdivisions where the subdivisions streets, one whole street will have a certain type of tree. You drive around Gawler and you probably find every sort of tree that you've ever thought of in one street. And I know that we're, we've been looking at the point of changing some of this in, in our town. Um, so when somebody wants to do something to their verge, as this is being looked at, uh, is it going to be sort of recommended that they be call a hybrid bottle bush or uh, Queensland Bohemia like 18th Street, 19th Streets and things like that? Is there going to be any sort of a guideline there? Mm. So I think that's more street tree planting as other than verge. Um, through you, Chair. Mm. Um, so in respect to tree management, the general principle is that if there's a tree being replaced in the streetscape, if we, we manage that sort of consistency in that streetscape, what the dominant species is. Um, however, that's not to say that we have the same species of trees throughout the entire Gorda. Um, one of the things that as staff we're very keen to um, pursue is a tree management strategy that provides some further framework in terms of the types of, you know, where we plant certain species of trees. Um, certainly in the new estates, there are a diversity of mixes of trees, but in the one street is a consistent streetscape. Yeah. So, and we do have a process for, for, for consideration of removal of existing trees. Um, there has to be certain circumstances that, yeah. yeah. Any other comments on just this motion to do with the landscaping verges? Oh, and the tree planting as well. Okay. Oh, I'm moving both. Okay. Right on. Right on. Any other comments? Okay. I'll put that. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Information reports. So, oh. oh, sorry. Okay, now I get you now. Yep. Oh, getting a bit confused about which one you put your lips split about. Okay. Karen, do you want to move that then? Jim, you want to move that? Yep. You happy to speak? Do you want to speak to it? No, okay. Someone like the second it? Cody, you want to speak to it? Yeah, just to say that um, I think when we um, waive the application fee, it would be good for people to know about it. So maybe if it went out out in a notice or something, you know, just to um, communicate that fact and see how many people we get that are interested in uh, landscaping their verges. Yep, excellent. So anyone else want to speak? David, do you want to have a look? Um, yeah, and it would be really good to actually have some good examples of where some of the, this, this roadside work has been done well. Because, um, yeah, unfortunately, as Councillor Fraser said, there's, unfortunately, there is areas in our town where it's been done 
very poorly. Um, so yeah, just even if that highlighted a couple of good pictures of people that have actually done it to code, so it, it's still a usable footpath um, would be good as well. Yeah. Any other discussion on this matter? No. Okay, I'll put that motion. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Now we're up to 8.1, are we? Yep, information reports. 8.1, review of Gawler Town Centre Car Parking Strategy. Key finding report. Right. Yes, it's a noting report. Oh, okay. 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 Do you, okay. Does anybody want to we've got the option of just voting on block for these two items, or we can draw one out and discuss each one individually? Yeah, Ruben. I'm happy to move them on block. We've got a second of that, Jim. Happy to do that. Any discussion? No. All those in favour? <laughs> Carry in on this. Let's quit. <laughs> Okay. It's up to nine, aren't we? Uh, nine. Items listed for discussion. Okay. Items listed for discussion at future meetings. Anything? Questions without notice? Yes, a little. Here we go. Yeah, I noticed today attending uh, the playground in Julia Terrace, I noticed that one of the toilets has been vandalised. I uh, wonder if there's been an estimation of cost for that. Mm. It's badly damaged. It's been locked off, uh, been secured properly, but you know, I was there with a few residents today and only been open a week and we've already got vandalism. Mm, I was just wondering what the costing would be there. I know I'll take the question on notice, but I just thought I'd like to raise it. Thank you. Any response? No. Take the notice. Okay. Any other questions without notice? Okay. Motions without notice? Oh, question. Yep. Quick. Yep. Go for it. I mean, Go for we've, it. we've talked about it. Um, and that sort of thing, but um, it's not going away, this grass problem. I just wonder whether Mr. Uh, Delima or anybody can sort of say, what do we do? I was speaking to um, uh, the neighbouring council the other day and they just said that they've just given up. I mean, when you drive out of Gawler here now, you know, you, you, you sort of think, well, you know, it's ready for a fire or mm. whatever it may be. It's absolutely disgusting. You know, to drive from here down, I, I was in a funeral procession, uh, not mine, but uh, uh, yeah. uh, on the other day, and going down the road, and the first thing people said to me when I got out of the car at the Smithfield Cemetery is, don't you guys know how to cut the grass? I said, excuse me, it's nothing to do with us, it is the state government. And again, communication, here we go. We have to make that known to the public, because otherwise they're saying our staff aren't doing it. You know, they've got plenty to do, but what are we going to do about it? I just wonder. Mm. I mean, what can we do? Can we stand yeah. out and, uh, you know, I don't know. Oh, I um, who, can, who can give us a bit of a CEO? You want to, or Sam, you want to have a bit of a stab at that? <laughs> there you go. Um, thank you, through you, Chair. <laughs> um, I, I honestly think we're banging our head against the wall. I think we've done everything we could possibly have done. I've lost count of the amount of times I've met with people, I've escalated matters. The mayor's probably done to death on this particular issue. <laughs> she's, she's met with minister multiple times and we've done multiple letters. We're just in the process of drafting a letter with about a dozen or more different issues that we have um, the, on this particular matter. Um, the, um, the, aside from pointing you know, making social media posts that effectively throw the state government under the bus and point people to where they can put their complaints in. It's probably the only other low 
you know, other option that we could do. And I'm sort of a bit loath to, to sort of progress in that manner, but it's, it's, it's not good. And it's not good in the sense that if we got contractors that have been employed by the state government to meet certain service levels that, that for the main part, we're satisfied with the staff. Um, if they just met those service levels and held those contractors to account, we'd actually be all, all quite satisfied. Um, so we continue to have the make fight the good fight, report things through the portal, engage with their stakeholder engagement managers to make sure that we do the right thing, right to the minister. And hopefully we're getting closer to seeing some you know, results in that space. But um, it's, it is a frustrating situation, Councillor Sandal. Mm. Yep. Mr Chairman, uh, the sad part about it, uh, Mr Lima, is it's, it's too dangerous to cut it now. That's how bad it mm. is. And this has been told to me by firemen, uh, 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 ex-councillor uh, in the fire brigade and all that sort of stuff. The other thing about it is that talking to the media, well, that they were talking to me about it, is that I'm trying to explain, as you explained to us very clearly, what about that over there where McCarran is? Oh, no, that's dip ties. What about over here? That's ads and so forth. The community doesn't know that. So we as elected members get phone calls and everything. Why aren't you cutting the grass? Well, sorry, this is dip ties, you know. I know it's a swear word, it's becoming a swear word, it really is. But we've got to tell the community uh, and say, let them maybe ring their politician or, or whoever may be, but, but we're not responsible for that centre strip that looks ugly all the way down the town. So I, I'm not sure where we move from here, but the community needs to know that we are doing what we're supposed to do, but the state government's not doing what they're. They obviously mm. ran out of lawnmowers. Okay, that's about there. What are you doing? Yeah. Um, any other questions without notice? Uh, motions without notice? I'll close the meeting. And I'll see you here on the 8th of February, 7 p.m. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, no, for the, oh, yes. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, oh, yes. Next, oh, yes, meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. No worries. Let's move. No, no, hopefully, no, no, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs>